So um, as Rochelle mentioned, uh, and others have mentioned, yeah, we're going to talk about sex today, lack thereof, uh, perhaps, um, but ways to kind of make things better. And, you know, I know, um, after surgery and treatment, and, and, um, and even after a cancer diagnosis, um, sometimes things will never get back to the way they were. Um, but definitely, there are a lot of strategies that we can um, integrate to help make things as good as they possibly can be. Um, some questions came in in advance of this talk as well, and uh, somebody had been asking about um, articles to read in, in advance of today's talk. Um, and I, I only just got those questions last evening, but really there was no pre-reading required. Uh, I'm happy to share slides. I'm happy to answer questions individual by um, email if, if that's your preference, if you'd rather not ask them in the, in the group setting as well. So um, feel free to, to definitely email me after the talk. So I just wanted to start out with the um, territorial acknowledgement and I'm in the Calgary area. So just to acknowledge the traditional territories of the people of Treaty 7 region in Southern Alberta, which includes the Blackfoot Confederacy comprising the Siksika, Pikani and uh, Guyanai First Nations, as well as Sutina First Nation and the Stony Nakoda, including uh, Chiniki, Bears Paw and Wesley First Nations. And the city of Calgary is also home to Métis Nation of Alberta Region 3. I don't have any um, relevant uh, financial disclosures. Um, I do receive some funding uh, from my PhD work, but this is all non-industry or non-drug. Um, uh, it's not related to drug companies or, or any products. And again, I always like to say, of course, uh, I can't be providing uh, medical advice, especially via Zoom like this. Um, happy to answer questions and, and perhaps give you some information that you can further discuss with your healthcare provider. Um, but everything that I say today, um, really, it, it can't be um, considered medical advice. So briefly, I just uh, would like to start by talking about the potential impact of pro prostate cancer and its treatment on sexuality and intimacy, and then get into some strategies to help optimize sexual health uh, and intimacy after a prostate cancer diagnosis. So this is quite a busy slide, um, but really just to make the point that uh, sexuality really, it's essential aspect of being human throughout life. Um, and it's not the same as sexual function. So sexual function is a piece of it, um, but is not only the only piece. Um, you know, one quote is that sex might be something that we do, but sexuality is something that we are. And I started, working in the area of sexual health and, and sexuality years and years ago. So I worked at the Cross Cancer Institute in Edmonton and worked with the prostate cancer or the genital urinary cancer group in Edmonton. And we asked people about their sexual health all the time in that, in that particular clinic. Um, and I started asking patients in the other clinics that I worked in as well. So patients with blood cancers or patients with, you know, colon cancers and other types of cancers and found that really altered sexuality after a cancer diagnosis is extremely common. Um, and it's not always talked about, even in the GU clinics or the prostate cancer clinics, it's not always talked about. Um, and there are some reasons for that, um, not good ones on behalf of the healthcare providers, I think. I think we need to be doing a better job at um, asking the questions and setting the stage and letting patients and their partners know that this is safe to talk about and uh, something that we should be um, discussing if it's an issue or concern for patients. But really, again, to make the point that sexuality is a very broad concept um, and encompasses aspects of self-image, body image, patterns of affection, social family and gender roles, as well as the physical and emotional intimacy components. Factors influencing sexuality may precede a cancer diagnosis. Uh, they might arise upon being diagnosed with cancer or they might emerge with treatment. And some of these factors may be associated with normal aging, while others may be exclusively related to the cancer or its treatment. We know that sexual function relies on nervous, vascular, and endocrine system function. And it's not, um, it's not just the body, right? We know that the brain is one of the most important sex organs. Um, and so there, there is a huge component there um, in terms of uh, psychological well-being and the influence of, of psychological well-being on sexual function as well. Um, and again, as I mentioned, um, self-esteem, body image, changes in mood, um, depression, anxiety, you know, fear um, of, of perhaps cancer progression or cancer recurrence, all of these can, can also impact sexuality. And if we think about it across the illness trajectory, so, you know, some people perhaps might not be thinking about sexual function and sexuality at time of diagnosis. There's, it's usually very overwhelming for people, um, but it is important, I think, that healthcare providers bring up the notion of, of sexual health at diagnosis, and particularly for people who are concerned about fertility preservation, this becomes really important to talk about at time of diagnosis. 
And then during treatment, sometimes people are not feeling particularly well. Uh, if there's you know, side effects associated with treatment, so they may not wish to engage in sexual activity. Um, but maintaining physical intimacy is something that a lot of people really desire and, and um, uh, strive to do during treatment, even if they're not feeling well. And that might not be sexual intercourse, but that might just be hugging or kissing or touching and cuddling. Um, and so it can, it can remain very important for people. Um, very often when I ran a sexual health clinic here in Calgary, um, this is where we would see people is in this recovery and survivorship phase. So their treatment had finished <clears throat> and it may have been years after their treatment even, and they were still dealing with um, long-term side effects. And very often that is um, impact on sexual function and relationships and intimacy. And then a lot of people don't think about uh, sexuality or sexual function at end of life or in the context of advanced disease. But again, it, it may not be sexual intercourse necessarily, but that desire for physical intimacy and emotional intimacy can very much be um, a really important integral part of, of people's end of life experience. <clears throat> so we know, and this is not just unique to prostate cancer, <clears throat> pardon me, we know that sexuality can be impacted by all the different kinds of treatment um, modalities that we offer for, for control or cure of cancer. Um, so in our clinic, we often would see decreased interest in sex. We would see, um, for men especially, a lot of difficulties with erectile function. Um, so that's ability to achieve and maintain erections, firmness of erections. Uh, there may be changes in, in ejaculation, changes in orgasmic sensation. Um, definitely the treatments can impact hormone function, particularly in prostate cancer. Um, <clears throat> and then there can be some disease and treat, uh, treatment specific uh, impacts uh, on, on sexuality. Um, and the psychosocial piece I think is, is really huge. And historically we may have perhaps uh, spent more attention uh, on, on this area with women, but this is equally important to men. And I did a study a number of years ago and all of the men in my study reported that um, uh, psychosocial issues were a huge concern in particular body image was a, a very big concern. So specifically related to prostate cancer, <clears throat> You know, the, there's a number of different uh, potential treatment options. Sometimes we, we will do what's called watchful waiting or surveillance where there's no active treatment or disease directed treatment that's going on. Um, but then there are other modalities as well. So surgery, radiation, hormone therapy, sometimes it's a combination of these um, or supportive care. So managing the side effects and, and um, sequelae of treatment. Um, <clears throat> I was happy to see these guidelines or recommendations published uh, uh, several years ago by the, um, or published in the um, Journal of Sexual Medicine, mentioning that uh, clinicians should always talk about the potential impact of treatment on uh, sexual function. And I know, unfortunately, this doesn't always happen, or it doesn't happen uh, in a comprehensive enough way for people to make fully informed decisions about which treatment um, option would be best for them. <clears throat> so we know that there can definitely be um, impacts of surgery and radiation uh, on sexual function in terms of erectile function, uh, changes in orgasm, changes in uh, ejaculation, um, and all of that can also impact, uh, obviously, the, the relationship experience as well. <clears throat> I feel like I've got a frog in my throat or something, sorry. Um, so surgery for prostate cancer, radical prostatectomy, um, <clears throat> and this can be done in what's called the open uh, radical prostatectomy approach, or robot-assisted or laparoscopic um, uh, radical prostatectomy. Uh, orchiectomy, <clears throat> oh, I'll just go through there and click. So orchiectomy is uh, removal of A or both testicles. And that is again, to control the hormone environment because we know that prostate cancer cells can grow in the presence of testosterone. And so if we remove the testicles, then we're removing that um, potential source of testosterone. Um, and then, Transurethral resection of the prostate or TERP. Um, <clears throat> this can be done uh, both in the context of prostate cancer, but also is sometimes done for, for men who have an enlarged prostate, um, even if it's benign. So benign um, uh, um, prostatic hyperplasia or BPH. Um, we know that after uh, radical prostatectomy, um, there can be uh, damage to the nerves that control uh, blood flow to the penis and damage to the nerves that control uh, erection um, and orgasm. And we know that uh, there can be changes in ejaculation, penile shortening um, with, um, uh, pardon me, where was I there? Um, with uh, transurethral um, resection of the prostate, uh, there can be retrograde ejaculation where the, ejaculate, the ejaculate goes into the bladder instead of out the urethra. 
Um, and there can also be uh, difficulties with erectile function. And radiation, and in most places in Canada, I believe right now we're not using yet um, uh, proton um, beam radiation, but we're using either external beam or, or brachytherapy or a combination. Um, and we know that radiation is associated with erectile changes. So 60 to 70% of men will experience uh, changes in erectile function. Um, and that might actually increase for the first year or two after radiation. So just because radiation is finished, it doesn't mean it's going to immediately uh, return to normal. Um, there can be decreased volume or absence of semen. Um, there can be uh, decreased interest in sex, uh, decreased intensity of orgasm, and overall decreased satisfaction with sex. And we know that, again, um, because of the radiation, there can be damage to the blood vessels, there can be damage to the nerves, uh, and all of this can impact um, erectile function and orgasm. For some men after radiation, they get a condition called epididymitis, where the epididymis um, is kind of irritated and there can be painful ejaculation. That painful ejaculation can also happen after surgery. That tends to improve over time, the painful ejaculation, but some of the other changes can be uh, a little bit more persistent. And again, as I mentioned, we know that prostate cancer uh, cells can grow in the presence of, of uh, androgens or testosterone in particular. And so if we can manipulate the hormonal environment or decrease the androgen production by the testes, then that offers us another means of, of trying to control the cancer. Um, but we also know that this doesn't just happen uh, to the prostate cancer cells in the body. This actually impacts a, a lot of different uh, cells and systems in the body. And so when, when people are treated with antiandrogen medications or androgen deprivation therapy, ADT as it's called, um, there can definitely be decreased interest in sex or des decreased desire, uh, erectile dysfunction. Uh, there can also be things like hot flashes, weight gain, um, breast enlargement, fatigue, uh, and also decreased uh, penile length and uh, reduced testicular size. <clears throat> Similarly, um, if we go a little bit more specifically into desire, um, you know, historically the Masters and Johnson um, uh, model of sexual response was almost a linear um, where, you know, you start with desire that's followed by excitement or arousal. And then there's a uh, plateau phase, then orgasm and then resolution. So in real life, we know it's not quite this linear. And um, particularly in women, this has been looked at a lot, um, that you don't necessarily need to have spontaneous desire in order to um, have arousal, excitement, and orgasm. So um, <clears throat> you may not necessarily have you know, the desire or interest in sex, but perhaps if you start cuddling or kissing or engaging in some massage, then you might become interested in having sex. Um, and so it doesn't need to follow this linear kind of process. And it, it definitely doesn't need to start with spontaneous desire. And I'll, I'll make the point again too that a lot of these changes definitely can be impacted by cancer treatment, but a lot of these changes happen naturally as we get older. Um, and certainly desire can, can also wane uh, as we get older. Um, changes in erectile function, definitely very common after um, prostate cancer. So there can be difficulty achieving erections. There can be difficulty maintaining erections, difficulty with firmness of erections uh, for either vaginal or anal intercourse. And, um, it, you know, for anal intercourse, um, you need about a 30% more firm erection than you would for, for vaginal intercourse. So that can be uh, an issue. Um, and then loss of spontaneous erections and loss of um, middle of the night or early morning erections as well. Again, this is common as we age and that more than 50% of men over the age of 40 will have some degree of erectile difficulties, even in the absence of, of cancer uh, and cancer treatment. But the good news is you don't need an erection for orgasm. And a lot of people are not um, aware of that, that you can still have uh, an orgasm with a flaccid or even semi erect penis. <clears throat> so again, we know uh, that there are lots of different reasons why there might be difficulties with uh, erectile function. So if there's nerve damage, uh, either from surgery or from radiation, that can be a culprit. Uh, again, from surgery or radiation, there might be damage to the blood vessels involved in producing the erection, changes in the hormones that are involved in producing erections, um, and definitely the, the um, uh, impact of, of the mind and, and um, the psychological impact on, on uh, contributing to erections, but in many cases, it's one or more of these, or I would say it's more than one of these in many cases, um, particularly after treatment for prostate cancer, we know that there can be um, 
damage to, to nerves, blood flow and hormones for sure. And then the impact psychologically can be very profound as well. And so with changes in ejaculation, there can be delayed or premature ejaculation. As I mentioned, there can be pain with ejaculation. Uh, that can be in the penis, it can be in the testicles. Some people feel it deep in their groin or in their abdomen. Um, there can be little or no, no ejaculate, <clears throat> which is very common after radical prostatectomy or is almost ubiquitous, I would say, um, and climacteria where there's uh, urine leakage at the time of ejaculation. Um, and so again, as I mentioned, the pain with ejaculation can happen because there's irritation caused uh, from radiation that tends to kind of subside the further you get out from radiation. Uh, again, that can also happen because of surgery. Um, and again, we know that if there's uh, radiation to the prostate area uh, or hormone therapy for prostate cancer, there may be reduced volumes of semen production. If the prostate and seminal vesicles are removed as they are in a radical prostatectomy, there will be no semen that's emitted at time of ejaculation and that's called dry orgasm. And some men say that that um, is associated with reduced sensation of orgasm. Some men actually say orgasm is more intense and some say there's really no change at all. Um, and again, uh, climacteria, um, you know, if there's damage um, to the nerves involved in, in um, uh, the release of urine and th this can cause urine leakage at the time of ejaculation. As I mentioned, you know, changes in orgasm, there can be a decreased intensity, increased intensity or no change. Uh, there can be painful orgasm or complete loss of orgasm. Um, you know, a, a lot of women, even after treatment for uh, cancer, will talk about orgasms being diminished or muted. Um, the reason there's this storm cloud here is one of the gynecologists um, that I had worked with in, in the past, and he works in um, California and runs a sexual medicine clinic there. He said that for women, uh, very often after menopause um, or after treatment for cancer, um, their orgasms change in sensation. So where there used to be a thunderclap, now it's just the pitter patter of rain. Um, so this can happen again, uh, just because of, of aging. Um, and certainly we know it can happen with, um, the different modalities of the, of, um, uh, treatment for cancer in both females and males. Fertility, again, I won't spend uh, much time on this because this could be its own separate talk, but Ideally, um, if somebody's interested in, in preserving fertility, this should be done before cancer treatment stop, uh, starts. And that's not always a reality for many. Very often people have to embark on their treatment immediately. Um, and you know, for men, uh, the best mode of fertility preservation is um, uh, semen cryopreservation. So uh, taking a semen sample and uh, storing that and freezing it and, and keeping it for future use. And that, uh, you know, there's some cost associated with that. It's usually, uh, at least in Alberta, about $400 for the first year of storage and then about 200 per year thereafter. Um, and there are some organizations that can help with um, the costs as associated with fertility preservation. And body image um, really, it can be a real significant concern. Uh, and, and definitely we know uh, after treatment for prostate cancer, there can be a number of different changes to, um, to body image. So, you know, we know that the loss of penile length and girth can happen after surgery, uh, androgen deprivation therapy, radiation. Um, the mechanisms underlying or the reasons why this happened are, are somewhat unclear, but um, they suspect that it's the loss of oxygen to the cavernosal tissues in the penis, um, which causes a profibrotic state and increased collagen deposition. Uh, and then that can cause uh, um, uh, loss of length and girth. Um, and, you know, this really kind of relates to, uh, and body image for men and women definitely relates to what our notions are of being a woman or being a man. Uh, and that varies depending on culture and, and varies depending on um, one's own perspective. Um, but definitely we know that body image can be adversely affected. And relationship issues as well. And so I think, you know, this is, this is challenging for existing relationships. It's challenging for people embarking on a new relationship. It's challenging for people dating. Um, you know, I think wondering what the impact will be on your relationship. If you've been together for many years, but you've never really talked about sex, this can be uh, a difficult thing to navigate. And so again, in centers where there's a, a sexual health clinic, this was part of what we did a lot in our clinic was helped couples to be able to talk about the changes that were happening in their sexual relationship, because there was a huge impact on the, the quality of their relationship overall um, after, you know, cancer treatment had impacted their sexual function. 
And partners, unfortunately, we don't have a lot of great research uh, looking at the partner experience, but we know that partners might be fearful of causing pain or discomfort during sexual activity. Um, they might feel unwanted or unattractive or rejected because they're, um, the, the patient, the person with cancer doesn't want to engage in sexual activity. They might understand why that's happening. They might think that their partner just doesn't love them or want them anymore. Um, this is a real concern too, that change in role from a partner to a caregiver requires that you switch that lens a little bit. And, and so a lot of people, particularly when they've really assumed a huge caregiver role, will say it's tough to switch back and forth between being a partner and being a caregiver, um, particularly where sexual activity is concerned. Um, you know, there may be concern about potential impending loss of the partner if this is advanced disease or an end of life situation and the partner might pull back a little bit, um, you know, just in anticipation of that, that loss. And then partners, of course, can have their own sexual health concerns as well. And again, some of that's associated with aging. Um, partners might have their own medical con conditions that impact sexual function as well. And so, you know, what we did a lot of in our clinic was try to figure out what do these changes mean to the couple? Uh, was there a huge dis discord between what one partner wanted in terms of sexual activity and what the other uh, wanted? And sometimes that was an issue, trying to reconcile that big gap between um, what they wanted. Um, and so really communication is a huge key part of this, um, but can be very difficult if this is not something that people have had much experience with in the past. We know also um, that we haven't done great work yet on sexual and gender minorities and, and the impact of um, cancer treatment on their sexual function. And we know, you know, between three and 12% of the, the population in the United States identifies as LGBTQ. Uh, in terms of cancer, we know that they, this population has lower rates of early detection, lack of access to screening, um, lack of <clears throat> resources tailored to their needs. So, you know, there, there can be gender identity mismatch. So um, you know, um, somebody who's undergone transition from male to female, um, they still usually retain their prostate. And so they still need prostate cancer screening. Uh, and that can be difficult for them to, to sometimes to reconcile. Um, and, and again, you know, our goal in, in healthcare is for equity, not equality. And I, I always use the example that, you know, we need to tailor our resources specific to this population. Um, we wouldn't say to somebody who was blind, oh, we treat everyone the same. So here's all of our, you know, handbooks and, you know, printed literature for you to read because we treat you the same as somebody who's not blind. We would actually tailor our, our resources to meet their needs. And we need to do the same for sexual and gender minority populations. Um, the American Society of Clinical Oncology has got um, some recommendations and, and certainly at our cancer center in, in when we were, um, we had a sexual health clinic that's uh, no longer operational, but when it was, this was something that we were trying to incorporate and uh, really um, um, adapt into our, our clinic and our approach. And again, just briefly, uh, this again could be a talk entirely on its own, but there can be some significant challenges for uh, gay, bisexual, and men who have sex with men after prostate cancer treatment. And so the prostate can be uh, very much a site of sexual pleasure during receptive anal sex. This is not just for men who are necessarily identifying as gay or bisexual. Um, as some men like their prostate to be stimulated. Um, the loss of ejaculate can also be a significant um, uh, concern or challenge. Uh, there can be rectal irritation or pain after uh, radiation and um, treatment. Uh, again, as I mentioned, you know, there can be in inadequate firmness of an erection for uh, anal intercourse. Um, there may have to be negotiation in terms of changing in positions from top to bottom. Uh, there may be no erection at all. And so having to incorporate different ways of uh, sexual activity um, might have to be considered. Again, as I mentioned, um, change in penile size might be relevant and might be concerning. Um, and again, transgender women, most um, patients who have tra uh, transitioned from um, uh, male to female, uh, typically they leave the prostate intact. Um, and so, and that's because of you know, the issues associated with removing the prostate, there can be urinary, and um, urinary concerns, urinary incontinence and things like that. Um, and so the prostate is usually there still, um, and we can't use PSA as an indicator for um, something going wrong with the prostate in, in these patients. Um, and so having to do, um, you know, exams and things like that, and just having this on their radar, I think is really important. 
the risk is probably quite low because again, we're, um, we're using androgen deprivation in this group, um, but it's not zero. So there's an education uh, piece for sure. And I think that, you know, if there is a diagnosis of prostate cancer in someone who identifies as a transgender woman, this is very difficult for them in terms of their identity. Um, it's a male associated cancer. And, you know, a lot of um, prostate cancer support groups are heavily, um, um, you know, men are, are heavily participating in them. So this could be a particular challenge uh, for somebody who identifies as transgender uh, female. Just quickly, again, I won't get into this too much, but certainly there have been some challenges with um, COVID and the lockdown. So some relationships, um, you know, have gotten stronger, some relationships have not. Um, and certainly I think everyone's faced some challenges. So, you know, having to be home with your partner all the time, um, if there are kids in the house still trying to find privacy uh, in order to engage in sexual activity can be very challenging. Um, we know that there have been some studies done uh, over the past year that have shown that uh, sexual activity will actually reduce anxiety and depression. Um, some people like to, to, to do that, to use sex as a, a stress reliever. Other people find that sex actually is not on their mind uh, during times of stress. Uh, and there's really no right or wrong to this. Again, this is just a matter of trying to um, discuss and negotiate with your partner and figure out what works for you. And so again, in our clinic, we really took a very biopsychosocial approach um, because we know that, that, that um, changes in sexual function and sexuality uh, particularly in the context of cancer, it's really very biopsychosocial. So we can't just fix the physical with, without thinking about the psychosocial piece and the interpersonal piece. Um, and so we were fortunate when our clinic was running, um, we had myself uh, in the clinic and I could handle some of the medical things and blood tests and physical exams and stuff like that. But we also had a psychologist in our clinic too. And uh, so we, we both would go in to see patients together and uh, really you know, took this very integrated um, comprehensive approach. And so, of course, you know, I think that the loss of sexual function is a loss and, and there is a grieving process associated with this. And, and for many people, sexual activity will never return to the way it was before. Um, that's not to say that it can't be good. It's just likely going to be different um, just based upon some of the things that have happened. And then again, you know, sometimes when we initiate something like Cialis or Viagra or some of the different strategies, they may not work initially and we may have to modify them and tweak our plan a little bit. Um, but just because something doesn't work up front, it doesn't mean that that's going to be the necessary path, that failure is going to be the only outcome. Um, there's a lot of different things that we can do. Um, Again, this, this whole notion of um, you're not interested in sexual activity and that linear model, um, consider still engaging in sexual activity, even if the interest is not there necessarily. Um, and then flexibility, of course, uh, in, in sexual activities. And certainly we've seen some creativity in the context of the pandemic where people have had to engage in more, um, you know, perhaps different sexual activity practices that they weren't even thinking about pre-pandemic, um, so sexting or, or um, you know, different kinds of activities, uh, perhaps over Zoom or, um, you know, erotic discussions over the phone and things like that. Um, and then even getting creative within your own house uh, if you're not able to go out. Um, and definitely, um, you know, be persistent with this. As I said, there's lots of different things we can try. So psychology and counseling, I think are a huge key component and I would advocate for this um, for everyone. So I think, you know, I'm a huge proponent of, of counseling even in the absence of any obvious issues with anxiety or depression or relationship issues. I think um, the counseling piece is really key. And then, you know, as much as we can from the, the healthcare provider side, if we can support the partner as much as we can so that they can remain in that partner role and not have to take on too much of the caregiving role, I think can also be really helpful. Um, there's lots of different um, devices and, and things that I'll get into in just a minute here. Um, and if, yeah, obviously if somebody's having a lot of pain or nausea or vomiting and things like that, they're not likely going to want to engage in sexual activity. And so if we can manage these side effects and symptoms, um, that can also really help. Penile rehabilitation is something that uh, you may have heard of before, and this is kind of a, a very specific um, kind of, uh, you know, structured way to, to make sure that erections are happening after prostate cancer um, treatment. Uh, and the thought behind penile re rehabilitation is that 
if erections are happening, that's meaning that blood flow is, is going to the penis and the penile tissues are being well oxygenated and therefore they'll be healthier. And um, so there is some thought that having, you know, having these erections even very early post, post-op and post-treatment uh, can help. Um, the literature and the research is kind of mixed on this. Um, so, I, I mean, I think you can still engage in a lot of uh, these kinds of strategies without necessarily following a very structured penile rehabilitation approach. Pelvic floor physiotherapy can also be very, very helpful, um, and particularly with climacteria. Um, and yeah, as I mentioned, referral to specialists as needed. So hormone doctors, um, urologists, um, that can, can also be helpful if needed. The communication piece, uh, as I mentioned, is really important. Um, so sharing these concerns with your partner, this goes both ways. Um, and, you know, sometimes you have to plan a ahead a little bit with sexual activity. It's perhaps not going to be as spontaneous as it once was, um, but really, you know, having this open communication, um, talking to your partner about what he or she wants, what feels good, what doesn't. Um, and again, this piece for some couples is somewhat new. And, and this in our clinic was an area that we were able to help facilitate um, with couples who didn't have a lot of uh, comfort with this approach. Um, but really, the communication piece is key. Um, improving intimacy. <laughs> this is this top one here is actually uh, from the Cialis website. And I always joke and say, these two actually, if they wanted to improve their intimacy, they should be in the same bathtub, not in separate bathtubs. <laughs> but uh, nevertheless, you know, not always thinking that uh, intercourse is the be all end all. So um, for some of our couples that we would counsel in our clinic, we would say, you know, take intercourse off the table um, and no, take that pressure off yourself. Find other ways to, to be physically intimate and that, that can be emotional intimacy, sensual in, intimacy, um, but not necessarily having intercourse. Um, so, you know, there are a lot of different types of activities that you can engage in. And then there's a specific type of exercise that our psychologists were trained in called sensate focus, where um, you know, this involves touching of each other's bodies, but it starts out very non-sexual to begin with, and there's lots of communication integrated into it as well. And it happens over a period of weeks, where by the end of it, you're touching, you know, genitals and touching breasts and things like that. Um, and by the end of it, you may start to get involved in more sexual activity. But the beginning is just to kind of learn about what feels good, what your partner likes and doesn't like. And if, you know, if there's radiation, sometimes the skin can be very sensitive or irritated or could even be numb. And so having discussions about what feels good and what doesn't, where you like to be touched and where you don't want to be touched. Um, and that can really help facilitate a good sexual experience. Improving desire. Again, we know that uh, this is something that can change as we get older. Um, but again, being aware of that responsive desire versus spontaneous. So you may not have that notion in your head that you're good to go at any minute necessarily. Um, but once you get engaged in a sexual or physical uh, connection with somebody, then the desire may come after that. Counseling can really help with this. Um, Mindfulness-based meditation can also be a really um, uh, useful strategy. And then again, for people who are on androgen deprivation therapy, uh, we've seen that taking a break or a drug holiday uh, from the medication can sometimes help with um, restoring some, some desire and some physical intimacy. Um, so this would be a case-by-case -case basis, and you'd want to discuss this with your oncologist. Um, but some people feel that the outcomes clinically are not necessarily adversely affected if you do take a break from, from the androgen deprivation therapy. And that would be very patient-specific. So improving erectile function, we always want to try to figure out what the reasons uh, are, um, but then there's a whole array of different strategies that can help. And uh, I'll get into these. So uh, this one here is, is the elator. Uh, this is custom made based upon um, the measurements of, of the person. Um, it is uh, around 350 US dollars. Um, and, you know, I've heard mixed reviews uh, about this device. I don't think that this would be the go-to approach necessarily. I think there are better devices uh, than this one. Um, certainly we've got a lot of experience with um, phosphodiesterase type five inhibitors. So these are drugs like Viagra, Cialis, Levitra. They're, they all work quite similarly. So they um, improve blood flow to the penis that leads to the erection. They're not helpful in all cases of erectile dysfunction. So if there's bad nerve damage, these drugs won't necessarily work. Um, and as I said, they all kind of work the same. Um, Tadalafil, um, 
or Cialis, sometimes called the weekender because it's got a longer half-life. That doesn't mean that you take it on Friday and you're walking around all weekend in the upright position. It just means that that window for opportunity is there um, because the drug stays in your system a bit longer. And Tadalafil also has a five milligram daily dosing option. So some people, um, if they want to have more spontaneity, if you're taking the lower dose every day, there's a steady state of that drug in your system. Um, whereas, you know, with the other uh, versions of it, you'd have to take it um, 30 to 60 minutes before sexual activity. So it kind of removes the spontaneity piece a little bit. All of these drugs, again, because they um, um, work by um, increasing blood flow, there is a concern or a contraindication about using with nitroglycerin uh, that can cause your blood pressure to go um, really low. Uh, the exception is Avanafil, but we don't have that one available in Canada yet, and it's got a very short half-life. Um, so, you know, otherwise they work uh, very similarly. Unfortunately, most drug plans don't cover the costs of these medications, so they can be uh, quite pricey. So. Other options for um, erectile, dis, um, erectile difficulties, um, intracavernosal injection therapy. Uh, and again, you know, this wouldn't be first line. So usually we would try one of the medications first or um, a vacuum erection device first. And if those don't work, then we might consider ICI. Um, ICI can be very, very effective, um, upwards of 85 to 90% effective, um, even if there is nerve damage. This bypasses the need for neural stimulation or neural involvement, and it can be very effective. Uh, in our clinic, I would teach men how to do this or their partners how to do this. Uh, I don't think any man is crazy about the notion of sticking a needle in the side of their penis, um, but honestly, it's a teeny tiny, um, a teeny tiny little needle, uh, like a diabetic size um, for giving insulin. So teeny tiny, you probably can't even see uh, the needle there. And it just goes into the side of the penis um, and can be very, very effective at inducing an erection. Um, Transurethral therapy, things like Muse, um, that would be a medication that's put into the urethra and then that gets absorbed into the um, uh, corpus uh, cavernosum and leads to an erection. Um, Again, the vacuum erection devices, you really need a good quality device. Um, uh, you know, you have to spend a few, a few dollars for this, um, but they can be very effective. And essentially they pump blood into the penis and then you put a constriction ring at the base of the penis and that keeps the blood in the penis. I know I'm a bit over time here, so I'll, I'll uh, speak quickly. Um, penile implants, so these would be surgically placed. Again, this wouldn't be first line. Uh, it's a bit more invasive because it requires surgery. Um, you know, but it, it's usually very well tolerated, uh, usually a hospital day of one to two or hospital stay of one to two days. Um, and usually these, um, you would need a regional or general anesthetic. Um, and then it, there are two different types. So one would be um, like a, a malleable rod that would be placed in the penis that you could then bend up into um, the position you need for sexual activity. And then you would bend it back down. So the rod kind of, st the rod stays in the penis the whole time. The other kind um, is the, the, the kind where a reservoir is placed in the penis, or I mean, um, a cylinder is placed in the penis, and then there's a reservoir that's usually filled with saline or salt water, um, and you would pump that up, and it would cause the penis to become erect. And then there's um, um, the little um, uh, pump thing that you would um, then use to, to deflate afterwards. So um, that is, both of those are uh, surgical interventions, um, but they are covered by healthcare. Um, but again, those wouldn't be first line just because of the associated potential risks with surgery. Uh, again, ejaculation changes. Um, so discussion with partners and awareness, I think is really important. And then to deal with urine leakage at time of ejaculation, um, really important to empty your bladder before sexual activity, avoiding some of the things that are going to cause um, urine, uh, urine uh, the diuretics, um, caffeine, alcohol, and things like that. You can use a constriction ring at the base of the penis and that can help. Um, you can use a condom uh, and that would, you know, um, contain the, the urine uh, that leaks out. Um, place towels underneath um, during sexual activity. Sexual activity in a bathtub or a shower uh, can also um, take away some of the concern with that. And pelvic floor physiotherapy can also help. Unfortunately, there's not been a lot of studies done on orgasmic dysfunction after um, prostate cancer. Um, again, this is where counseling and mindfulness can really be helpful. Um, studies ongoing about penile vibratory stimulation, the studies haven't been all that compelling so far, um, but that's definitely a potential uh, strategy. And then there's some, some studies that have looked at um, medication. So uh, uh, 
Flomax or uh, Tamsulosin or uh, Cabergoline. Um, there have been some studies that have looked at those medications uh, and found some, some improved um, orgasmic function afterwards. Again, not super compelling, um, but work being done in this area for sure. Um, and this is definitely a controversial area, um, testosterone replacement after prostate cancer. Um, and so that would be, um, you know, using testosterone to help improve sexual function. And we know that there seems to be a limit uh, to the ability of, of hormones to stimulate prostate growth. So it's not this linear uh, fashion where, you know, there's X amount of um, testosterone and it kind of goes on forever that the higher the amount of testosterone, the more risk you're at. It seems to plateau, um, but we don't know for sure um, who this would be safe for. And so it likely so far preliminary studies are suggesting it might be safe in people with a history of treated localized prostate cancer. So someone who's had surgery or radiation with curative intent to get rid of their prostate cancer, where it's a bit more unclear is if there's advanced or metastatic cancer. And then definitely if there's untreated uh, prostate cancer, that might be a worry. Uh, I already talked about this a little bit, penile vibratory stimulation. This is the Vibrect, the device that they use. Uh, you can also use commercially available vibrators and they, you know, they all work a bit differently. This one can be used like a constriction ring and vibrates, you place this on the base of the penis. Um, there's another one called the Gyberator, and this can be used with a uh, flaccid or semi-flaccid penis and it vibrates. Um, and some men find that very helpful actually in inducing um, uh, orgasm. I'll just say that, um, herbal or natural products, just be careful that um, uh, sometimes these products will purport to improve sexual function. Um, but there was a, um, a paper presented at the World Meeting on Sexual Medicine a few years back, and the researchers tested herbal and natural performance enhancing dietary supplements um, purporting to have phosphodiesterase um, type 5 inhibitors in them. And they found that um, some of the the products contained more than one active drug. Some contained no drug. Um, they had problems with labeling. They didn't have expiration dates or lot numbers. And then others had fillers like brick dust or um, uh, ink toner and stuff like that. So just be very cautious about um, products like that. Again, I know I'm over time by a lot. I'm sorry, I'm almost done. A couple more slides. Um, preserving intimacy. Again, making the point that it's not just about sexual function. There's a whole bunch of other components as well. So, you know, physical affection, maintaining that. Um, and then looking at erection dependent sex. So that's where we have some of those medical interventions I was mentioning, the medications, the injections, vacuum erection device or implant surgery. And then the, all these other things that you can try in the absence of erections, you don't need erections for these things. And then the relational intimacy piece is also very, very important. So to sum up, um, it's really common for people to have changes in sexuality after a diagnosis of prostate cancer, and that's common for both the patient and the partner. There's lots of different things that we can uh, offer to help improve sexual function. And there really is no such thing as a right amount of desire, no perfect relationship, no such thing as a normal sex life. Um, this really just depends on what's important for you and your partner. So yeah, talk to your healthcare providers to find out what options are best for you. If something's not working, uh, ask for another option uh, and, and keep talking to your partner and to your healthcare provider and don't give up. These are some websites. And again, I can send you the slides, um, lots of awesome books. And I'll, I'll point out Glenda's book here that is fantastic. And I uh, offer this one to patients all the time and they really like it. Um, lots of different resources for LGBTQ uh, patients as well. And just to end on a joke, because <laughs> I work in palliative care and we often give stool softeners and things like that too. So this guy says, oh no, I mix Viagra with x -lax. Now I don't know whether I'm coming or going. And I will stop there. And uh, thank you all. Well, thanks, Rianne. Um, okay, so let's move into our questions. Does anybody have any questions? Um, I think the best way for us to do this would be just to raise our hands virtually, if you know how to do that. Um, there should be an option at the bottom of your screen to raise your hand, and I'll see um, see them come up in the order that they. And I just see there's a comment by Dr. Richard Wasterstag, who's uh, on the line here. I didn't know that. Um, and so he's got a couple questions. Um, and uh, I wonder if um, Dr. Wasterstag, can you mention Lauren's study? Because I actually don't know much about Lauren's penile prosthesis online research study. If you can provide a bit of information about that, that'd be great. 
Uh, <laughs> hello, everyone. Um, so um, I'm Richard Wasseseg, uh, and I do some research in this area. In fact, several of my, yes, the uh, preferences were to work that I've done with Lauren Walker. Um, so there's uh, one of the things you, you didn't mention, I thought that was an incredibly comprehensive uh, talk where you covered everything pretty much. One of the things um, you didn't mention is, and this is gonna sound a little odd, the use of an external penile prosthesis, which in the, uh, in the lesbian community is known as a strap-on dildo. But there's actually a research study on its effectiveness for prostate cancer patients. Uh, and Lauren Walker is leading that study and it's an online study. And I, we're looking for, well, I'll confess, I'm on that study as well. We're looking for people to, uh, to fill in that questionnaire. So um, uh, I'm wondering as a follow-up, uh, uh, if you would be willing to just get the word out, because there's such a large audience here. You've got like 50 people here today, or more than 50 people. Uh, it would help uh, get the numbers up on that study. It's a simple online survey about uh, would people be willing to explore this option? That's what the study is about. And, um, and uh, 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 either I can pull it up, or uh, Rochelle, I can get it to you, or um, Ryan, you could get it to Rochelle or something like that. But anyway, it's a follow-up to where to try to extend this. I mean, we recognize we need more options. And I guess if I can make a general comment from where you began, uh, you talked some. You didn't use the word unmet needs, but how mm -hmm. often uh, the topic of sex doesn't come up. Uh, when it is an issue on behalf of the patients. And I think in defense of the clinicians, not you, of course, but the majority, if you have a problem that the patients might present, but you as a clinician can't solve it, you don't want to necessarily bring it up. Yeah. <laughs> so if the patients don't want to, if the doctors don't want to ask about it, it maybe because they're fearful that they will be presented with a problem they can't solve. Yeah, so that's a great point. And in fact, when we had our clinic running, uh, that was feedback we received from clinicians is that once they knew that there was something they could do, um, when, when they identified there was a problem, that they were able to refer the patients to our clinic. They asked the questions much more um, frequently because you're right, they, they don't wanna know if there's something that they can't help with. Uh, it becomes a little bit more challenging to even ask those questions. So once we had our clinic, and they had somewhere to refer patients, they started asking questions a lot more. Uh, and we definitely saw a lot of referrals. Um, uh, I'd like to ask a follow-up question on that specifically. You mentioned this clinic. Uh, I was surprised you also mentioned it no longer exists. Yeah. So what happened to it? Um, it sounds wonderful. So, so can you give us a little bit more history? Where was it? When was it? Who was your clinician yeah. you worked with? So I worked with John Robinson and Lauren Walker. So you mentioned Lauren, she's a psychologist and John also is a psychologist. And uh, so we initially were funded by a grant and it was a very comprehensive multidisciplinary kind of approach. And we had physicians, radiation oncologists that would rotate through the clinic as well. Um, unfortunately, when it turned to operational funding through the cancer center, they um, did not think that we needed as many clinicians and they, um, they reduced it to... Um, myself, um, and they cut my position to a point one. Um, so it, it just, it was no longer sustainable. Uh, I couldn't do what I needed to do to run the program, the clinic and everything on a point one. And we, were, we weren't able to offer the same kind of comprehensive care that we felt was really crucial. Um, and so sadly, um, it's, it's no longer um, running. Sorry and, to hear that. Yeah, uh, and, and Dr. Wasserstag, your other question about um, the PSA uh, for, for uh, male to female transgender gender patients, it's because the feminizing hormones that are given to um, the, the female transgender, pa male to female transgender patients, they lower the PSA. So it doesn't, it's not, it's no longer a reliable indicator. Um, nope. All right, so I'm on those drugs. I must look okay. like your average transsexual, but I'm actually a prostate cancer patient on mm -hmm. high dose estrogen to control my uh, PSA uh, and my, my disease. And it, it certainly the number itself is not going to be valuable, but a change in the number yes. uh, is. And then, and we have a paper submitted uh, very much encouraging the uh, MDAF transsexuals to still get a PSA test uh, for looking for change. Yes, uh, that's key, as you say, and that's key for anybody, even in, in the absence of, of you know, the treatment. It's the change in PSA that would plague you. And I know that Rick and Glenda have spoken about that um, before. And Rick, I, I think actually Glenda talks about that in the book as well. That change, I think, is really key. Um, it, it's difficult, and we're lucky in Calgary, we have a family physician who's very interested in transgender health. Um, but you can imagine how difficult it might be for somebody who identifies as female going into their primary care provider and asking for a PSA or asking for assessment for this. It's, it's difficult to begin with, and, um, but you're quite right. I mean, monitoring this, I think, is, is really key. Thank you. 
Okay, um, so just uh, following up for regarding that study that you mentioned, Dr. Wasserzog, if you send me the link, then I can send it out to everybody. Great, thanks. The meeting. Good, thanks. Um, okay, so we've got a couple of questions here in the chat. Um, what about Sildenafil generic versus brand names? So again, I think um, I've seen patients use um, all of them. And I think whatever works best for you, I, I think, you know, we know that there can be placebo effect associated with these drugs. Um, theoretically, there should really be no different between brand name and generic. Um, but that being said, you know, some people do better on, on certain drugs. I think that it's worthwhile to try the generics first because they certainly are less expensive. But um, if somebody has a strong preference, and knowing that there is a, a bit of a placebo effect, it, it I wouldn't be I wouldn't be against, against it if somebody wanted to stick with the brand name. It, there just is the cost factor, and you know somebody else has asked, what can we do to move drug plans um, it, to recognize the need to fund sexual health? Um, and, and that's a really important question. It's not just about the drug plans; it's also about the cancer centers and creating sexual health clinics and recognizing this this need overall. Um, for addressing sexual health. It's really important. I think, you know, in our situation, what moved us from, um, you know, uh, study funding to operational funding, it, a lot of it was the patient voice. A lot of it was patients and caregivers um, speaking out and saying that this was a huge issue and it was a very unmet need. And, um, and, and that really helped. Um, so I think the same with the, the drug plans as well is getting that feedback out for sure. And, and you know, we can... As clinicians, we talk about this all the time and we push and push and push, but I think that there you know, definitely is something to be said when the, when the patients speak out for sure, as difficult as that can be sometimes. Um, yeah, there's another question here. What is the cost of ICI in Canada? Yeah, so, I mean, it varies. Unfortunately, uh, the drugs used in ICI are, again, typically not covered by drug plans. They're compounded usually, and at least in Calgary, um, the clinic or the pharmacy that we use, we typically used one pharmacy because they, they made a lot of the uh, medication. They would um, make it in a big batch. And uh, one of the urologists in Calgary here, he would send his patients there as well. And I would send my patients. And so it usually costs about um, $70 a vial. Um, and that usually would last for a few months. And again, it depends on how often you're having sex. Um, Usually you would not be using that more than, um, you know, a couple times a week. Um, yeah, somebody's saying $2 per shot. Um, and, and so, yeah, it's, um, that's actually decent, I think. Uh, again, it depends on how often you're having sex and how, how often you're, you're injecting. Um, but yeah, it was roughly about $70 a, a vial here in Calgary. Uh, 